welcome to this online part platform. So, in the last lecture we discussed about the typology of course in the context of commons and collective action problems. Today we will be discussing about some uh, recalls that we have already discussed in the last class. So, the contents uh, would be broadly recapitulations of previous uh, lessons along with some of this theory uh, seminal theories on the collective actions. So, in uh, seminal theories as we have already understood that we will be uh, talking about three theories. The first one is the Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons. So, today we will be discussing the this uh, thesis of the tragedy of the commons itself. So, uh, if you analyze and recall the last lecture that we are talking about, it is about the typologies of the goods. So, there we talked about we, we started with the typologies of the goods and uh, discussed Samuelson's twofold classification of the goods that is public goods and the private goods, which he talked uh, in his article that is pure theory of public expenditure in 1954. So, along with that, along with this twofold classification of the good that is uh, public good as well as private good, we also al uh, added another type of goods in this category uh, in this classification that is named as club good. So, if you see this club good classifications, the uh, credit goes to uh, Buchanan, uh, which he talked about this good in his An Economic Theory of Clubs in 1965. But however, if you see the another category of the uh, goods that is collectives or commons, so uh, it has its traditions uh, and its conceptions are found in the philosophical literature in the writings of the Plato, Aristotle, John Locke, Rousseau, David Hume. Adam Smith as well as John Rawls. So, in economic literature, this concept of the common goods, commons or collective goods is pertinent to the subfield of economics that is welfare economics. So, uh, moreover you, you can say that if you want to see the, the development of this, uh, uh, this uh, concept commons that is also his application in the subfields like environmental economics and ecological economics as well. And uh, then we talked about the attributes of non-excludability and non-rivalness by taking into account the, uh, the terms by R. A. Musgrave's contributions of these two attributes to classify different typologies of the goods. By, uh, by then uh, along with this, then we need to talk about the modification to the classification of the goods by uh, these two authors. The first one is Vincent Ostrom and the second one is Eleanor Ostrom. So, what are the modifications? So, we talked about the public goods, we talked about private goods and the third one we talked about is the club goods which was contributed in the theory of Bujanas, Bujanan's theory in 65. So, what is the modification his, he, uh, they proposed, both of them uh, proposed that is Vincent Ostrom as well as Eleanor Ostrom. So, the modification are this, the, uh, the fourfold. The first one is replacement of the term rivalry of consumptions with the subtractibility of use. So, if you see the, the, uh, the categorizations or the terminology is developed by R. A. Musgraves that is non-excludability and non-rivalry. But however, in, in, uh, in, uh, in this modification of the goods in defining this club goods, uh, Eleanor Ostrom as well as uh, the Ostrom, uh, Vincent Ostrom, they talk about some changes that instead of using this rivalry of consumption, we can use this subtractability of, of, of the use of that particular resource. So, this is their contributions in the, in the classification of the goods itself. The second contribution in this classification of the goods by this couple is that instead of talking about the mere presence and absence of this particular attributes that is whether the excludability characteristics is present in the particular good or the subtractability of use or, or you can say rivalry or non-rivalry uh, attribute is present or absent in a particular good, we can say we can actually have a level, have a scale that instead of saying mere presence, we can actually level their presence that what is the to what extent this particular level of attribute is present in that good. That is we can categorize and level them from low to high which can be assigned to that particular good. So, this is the second, uh, second uh, modifications and suggestions both of the authors they have talked about. 
and the third one uh, is uh, they wanted to add the, the fourth type of good which is known as the common pool resources. When you talk about the typology of the goods, the, for the first time we talked about these three kinds of goods, one is private, public and the third one is the club. So, this is the fourth in addition to all these, this is the fourth categorization of the good they suggested for the categorization and the classification of the goods. So, if you see this common pool resources obviously, it is having its uh, two types of attributes, one is subtractability uh, in use and the second one is difficulty in its exclusion. So, difficulty in exclusion is the same as non-excludability and the subtract subtractability in use is uh, the same as the rivalry. So, uh, and the last one that was also suggested by both the authors in, in the classifications of the goods is changing the name of the club good to toll good. Why they want to change the name of the good? Because the attributes are same uh, whatever uh, it was suggested by Buchanan. So, only we are we are replacing this rivalry of consumptions with subtractability of use. But why then we need to change uh, the nomenclature or name of the uh, good itself from the club good to, to toll good? Because uh, this facility is provided by very small units, organizations, maybe private, maybe government sometime. So, when this, this kind of facilities is provided by the government, let us talk about or, or some governmental, small governmental organizations, then let us talk about the case of the toll tax. And the second one is, let us talk about some society, let us say a cultural uh, assigned society like your uh, Tamil society or your Bengali society. So, if you are member of this particular society based on a cultural heritage, then uh, there is a facility that you can actually access to this, this first benefit or second benefit. So, in this case, the non-members who are let us say they are uh, not uh, they are not belonging to the Tamil society or the Bengali society. So, someone is from Maharashtra or some Gujarati then obviously, he or she will, will not having any membership to the society and as a result she or he will not get any benefit out of this society. So, this, this is this is the example that how this kind of uh, uh, toll can actually be provided by a uh, public group or the governmental organization, small organizations or a private group or private organizations as well. So, in this context, we will be discussing about the issues of these typologies of the goods. So, generally we are talking about uh, these issues and problems are because of these two attributes itself. So, let us talk about in addition to these two attributes that is excludability and, uh, uh, and uh, rivalryness. So, uh, the other uh, problems of the this classification of goods, let us talk about the public good itself. So, these issues are the market failure cases or the externalities cases and the third may be uh, due to the lack of well defined property rights. So, in this context, you will be just uh, wondering about what all these problems are or how these issues are actually related to the classification of the goods and the first classification of the goods is our public good. So, uh, if you if you want to actually analyze all these uh, all these concepts, then we need to define it, then we will be saying whether uh, these are the problems uh, that we are finding in this classification of the goods as well. So, let us talk about the first uh, concept that is market failure. So, what is market failure? That means, this, the, the very word actually uh, says that market fails right. So, for, what does it mean market fails? So, generally in economics we are saying that market can function when there is two functions or the two, two forces present in, in for that particular good or for that particular service. So, that means, the demand and supply concepts are necessarily related to the market situations which actually establishes the price systems. But here, when you are saying market fails, that means this mechanisms that is that is supply and demand, they are not a function functioning uh, in a free manner, or they actually cannot. We cannot actually define this demand and supply functions. So that's why the market fails because we cannot actually find any price systems in this context. So, uh, and just to define it, this market situation, this market failure is a situation when market just fails to what to provide some efficient distribution of goods and services in the in the free market and 
uh, if you want to see this this the second concept what is the definition of the second concept that is externality the externalities means when the action of one person benefits or costs another person who is not at all related in this transactions or action of the first function of uh, first person then this thing can be termed as externalities that means if my action is affecting you but you are not related to my work in any manner then obviously it is a case of externality so externalities may be positively benefiting or uh, negatively uh, affecting you so externality in, can work in both the ways positively or negatively accordingly it will be known as positive externality or uh, negative externality then um, the third one that we wanted to discuss that why what are the issues related to this public goods is the well defined property rights so apart from these two attributes we are which we are saying because of which the market fails that is the two uh, criteria non excludability and non rivalry this well defined property rights is also responsible for failing the market or it can actually bring the market failure as well so what are the very features of the property right that we are saying and because of which we are facing the cases of market failure in 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 the um, in the public uh, good itself so the the very features would be the exclusivity that means no externalities would be present whatever the benefits or whatever the cost you are accruing so it must be included in your production function itself it should not affect the second one either in production nor in uh, neither in production nor in consumption as well and the second one is enforceability so what is the meaning of this enforceability so obviously this is the second uh, features of the property right well defined property right so they are we are assuming that if you do have well defined property right then obviously if you are owning this property and you do have property right that means the second cannot encroach so the legality is there and you can secure your, your property so you can actually protect your property because there would not be any kind of encroachment by the second person on your property itself and the third of features of this property right is the transferability so what is transferability here so that means if i am owning a property or a good and i do have property right so that means if i want in my necessity out of my choice then i can actually transfer to you i can actually sell you give to you right and this is how you can you can say that and there would be no problem in transferring the ownership from my my ownership to your ownership and another characteristics of this uh, property right is comprehensibility so that means the property rights should be owned either privately or collectively so if it is privately then obviously it is you who is having ownership and if it is collectively then a group of persons or or a communal person or a community they they are having this ownership no one is having ownership individually but yes a society or a particular group they do have ownership rights of that and uh, the and in some of the liter literature we can also find uh, another characteristic of the property right so it is universality so that means whatever the characteristics what that we have discussed under this property right it should be universally acceptable everyone should accept this that yes it should not have any uh, any negative externalities or positive externalities and uh, if i am having this ownership then obviously uh, no one would be allowed to uh, encroach it and it will be i can uh, also easily transfer to you if i wish and the property right would be own pri either privately or collectively so these are the characteristics which are accepted by everyone so this is a kind of universal access accessibility acceptability of uh, these characteristics so apart from all these that we are discussing about this uh, issues in this classifications of the goods or the very nature of the goods that we have uh, classified based on these we can actually talk about that why the first case is occurring that is the case of market failure failure in case of the public goods why market fails we have just talked about that the demand and supply functions will not be well defined and that's why it is leading to the case of market failure but what kind of problem we are actually facing 
So, it is a supply side problem not a demand side problem. Why it is not a uh, demand side problem? Because when the public goods would be provided by the public authority of the government, then everyone would be would be interested to consume and if someone is not interested even, he can con consume it will be freely available to him. So, it is not a uh, sub, uh, demand side issue. However, it is a supply side issue. Why it is supply side issue? Because uh, no private person would be interested to produce this public good because it will not be getting or the, the person would not be getting any profit out of this provision of the public goods. Again why? Because here the marginal cost of producing this good is 0. If the public good is provided to you, then the say and if the some other uh, person wants to consume the same thing, then it can be provided to this the third person or the second person without any additional cost. Right. So, that is what you can say if the marginal cost is 0, then here it is leading to the, the case of no profit and if it is no profit case then obviously, the private person they will not be interested to uh, provide the good and because of which we are facing a supply side constraint or supply side um, problem in providing the public good. So, this will be leading to the case of market failure. So, after understanding this, this, this recapitulation as well as some of the additions to, to the typology of the goods and some of the problems, let us discuss about the first theory in the collective actions that given all these these attributes of these goods, given the classification of the goods, we are getting some problems, right. Then what would or what are the seminal ideas or what are the seminal theories that are already existing which talks which uh, talks about the very nature of this uh, collective action problems and how they can be actually solved. So, uh, the first theory that is the tragedy of the commons which is narrated by Garrett uh, James Hardin in 1968. And if you see the biography of uh, Garrett Hardin, so he is an American ecologist as well as philosopher. And uh, if you go through the, the original art article that is the tragedy of the commons, so whole of the article is uh, revolving around the problem of overpopulation which he is saying that it is a case of population explosion. And then after knowing that it is a case of overpopulation or population explosion, he is explaining, then he tries to find out what are the uh, solutions to this over overpopulation uh, or population explosion. However, he is not finding any solution to this overpopulations. So, firstly, he is saying that there is no technological solution to this problem. So, why is saying that he is assuming that there is no technical solution, uh, solution to this problem? Uh, because he has uh, taken the the articles uh, of uh, Weissner and work which he, they have published in 1964 regarding the dilemma of military power and national security so it was on it was on the the uh, nuclear uh, power uh, and the national security so there they try to find out that there is a dilemma between these two goods sorry between these two words the first one is the military power and the second one is national security so that means when the military power is increasing steadily then what will be happening to the national security of that particular country so it will be steadily decreasing why again so when you are saying suppose say our country is actually increasing the military power so, that means, it does not necessarily lead to the increasing national security rather than decreasing na national security because the enemy countries they would be also increasing their military power. So, as a result the very security of the country is getting threatened not getting secured. So, that is why there is they have found this dilemma that there is no tech technical solution to this problem because when you are possessing your technology or you are actually bringing new technologies and new innovations in your military power and you are thinking that you are actually increasing the strength of the military power as a result the national security will be increasing, but the same thing can also be followed by your enemy country. 
So, that is why instead of saying that your national security is increasing, it actually happens that the national security is decreasing. That is why for this problem of the military power and national security, security the both the authors they talk, they, uh, talk that, that there is no technical solution to this problem. So, just like this, this example, Hardin also thought that there is no technical solution to the problem of population explosion. Again, why? So, in, in, in his uh, uh, article by taking into account by explaining different examples, he actually opposed and probed that how there is no technical solution to the, this uh, population explosion. So, uh, first of all he uh, tried to probe and try to explain the, the theories or the very uh, approaches of three learned people who worked on the population itself or who talked about population explosion itself. The first one is Thomas Robert uh, Malthus, the second one is Jeremy Bentham and the third one is Adam Smith. So, how this, how their theories or how their perceptions and the, the assumptions is applicable to this and how this, uh, how their ideas are taken into account in explaining this uh, population explosion by Garrett Harin. So, let us talk about this. So, the first one is, this is the uh, Malthusian problem of population explosion. So, what he actually preached about uh, during this, uh, the, during his writing that population naturally tends to grow geometrically or we are saying exponential growth of population is there, he preached about. And the second thing is that when the population is increasing exponentially, what is happening, happening to the supply of food? The supply of food is also increasing, but it is arithmetically. So, obviously, they cannot balance. When something is increasing geometrically, it cannot balance when some, some other thing is actually increasing arithmetically. So, this is the problem that how the what is the repercussions of the population explosion. So, that is why he talked about this metaphor of commons. So, uh, so, as a result or as a consequence, he talked about that, that when population explosion is there, when the growth of the population is geometrically increasing and the food supply is is arithmetically increasing. So, as a result the per capita share or per capita availability of world's resources they must be decreasing, steadily decreasing. Because again we know that we do have a finite world and in a finite world obviously, the, the production or the supply of food cannot be infinite. Because we are saying the population is exploding that means, we are saying we are trying to say that population would be growing infinitely. So, if the population would be growing infinitely and we cannot actually produce the supply of food or we can produce, we cannot actually produce the food uh, in, in infinite manner because we are uh, assuming that or we do have this finite world. So, what is the solution? Because this is the problem we are facing, then what would be the solution? So, is it the technology that can uh, solve the problem or you can say, uh, who else can be can able to solve this problem. And uh, what is the constant here? The constant here is we are actually talking about a finite world and a finite world can only support a finite population. So, what would be the conclusion out of this scenario that we have narrated that the population growth must eventually equal to 0. Otherwise, we will be facing this problem or the, the problem is not actually going to be solved. So, this is what in brief uh, um, Malthus has talked about uh, in his theory. But however, in practical world, if you see the scenarios across the countries and nations and continents, this scenario is not found. What is the scenario we are not, we are not uh, actually realizing? That population is increasing and it is the, the food supply is not increasing at that level and we do have a finite world. Therefore, the assumptions or conclusions that we are that uh, Malthus talked about that population growth must eventually equal 0, this is not realized. So, this is the first thing Hardin talked about related to the commons that is here we, he talked about the commons as the case of the population explosion. Thus, the, then he talked about the second ideas by 
which was uh, talked about uh, by Jeremy Bentham. So, what is his ideas or what is his assumptions he talked about? He is known for his utility maximization or uh, which is known as uh, utilitarian concept. That means, according to him or according to the schools of thought, those who are the believing this utilitarianism, they are saying the maximum benefits must be achieved. So, in this word he can say that the greatest good for the greatest number, how to achieve it? These are the two things, the first one is the greatest good and the second one is greatest number. So, in this context if the population growth is 0, what would happen to his assumptions of this maximization of uh, benefits for the greatest good for the greatest number, right. And then if you see this sentences that is how to achieve this greatest good for the greatest number then we are actually finding two obstacles in achieving this the greatest good for the greatest numbers. So, what are the uh, um, obstacles? The first one is that this is not feasible because of uh, these reasons. One is mathematical reasons and the second one is your biological reason. So, what is the mathematical reason behind this that you cannot actually maximize the greatest good for the greatest number? The if you see mathematical then you can say uh, that it is not possible to maximize for two or more variables at the same time. We can talk about, we can take the examples of uh, partial differential uh, equation or we can talk about the game theory. So, if you are taking into account these two examples, then we are finding that obviously in mathematics we cannot actually uh, maximize two or more variables at the same time, at the same point of time. And that is why we cannot actually achieve this maximization of the greatest good for the greatest number because these are two variables and we cannot actually maximize both. And the second reason is the biological facts. So, what is the biological facts? When you are saying it is the greatest good and we are trying to maximize the benefits out of it. So, what is the maximum good per, per, per person? Is it defined? What is the maximum number per person? And if it is defined that this would be like 100 number of goods per person, but which kind of goods, right? Then what, what type of goods? Because nature of goods are different and accordingly which type of goods one is requiring is different. Then how to say that how to maximize the good per person? So, just for example, we can take that for, for a person or a particular person is interested in two goods here. Let us say one is estuaries with the factory lands, right. But if you are trying to say that the person is maximizing this amount of estuaries with the maximize, he also uh, want to maximize the factory lands, then it is two goods, one is estuaries and the second one is factory lands, they do have different attributes. The nature of this goods or if you see believe in this classification of the goods, then you can assign to the attributes, then you will be finding they are totally different goods. Then how can you maximize it? Because they are measured in different un units or they do have different characteristics. So, this is the second region because of which we cannot actually achieve the greatest good for the greatest number. And the third logic or the third idea hurting uh, had taken from Adam Smith. So, again what is the assumption of Adam Smith or how he is, he has put forth his assumption that decisions reached individually will in fact be the best decision for an entire society. So, whatever the decision a particular individual uh, takes that is the best decision for the society itself and that is why the societal benefits would be maximized. That is what he assumed, but again is it the fact that if you have you are maximizing your benefits by taking a particular decision whether it will be leading to maximize uh, societal benefits as well. Then again if this assumption is correct then this non intervention of the government that is laissez faire in the reproduction system itself here population explosion we are talking about this can be continued and we can assume that when uh, human being will control their fertility to produce the optimum, uh, optimum population. Because here what is the assumption that decisions reached individually 
will be leading to the best decision for the society. That means, a single individual he knows what would be the optimum level of uh, population itself. But if it is the case, then the, the case of population explosion would not have arrived. But however, if you see this, these are not the realistic terms and we are actually in a real world facing some different scenarios regarding this population explosion and this may be termed as the tragedy of the freedom in the commons to reproduce. So, what is the tragedy here? The tragedy of the freedom. Every individual is having the freedom, uh, freedom to take his own decisions and again it is assumed that these decisions are the best decisions for the society itself and that is why it is leading to the tragedy in the commons itself in terms of over, uh, in terms of population explosion. So, in this lecture, we discussed how Hardin defined the problem of population uh, growth or population explosion and in the next lecture, we will be continuing uh, with the uh, this uh, same topic uh, to discuss how Hardin has taken the metaphor of commons in order to explain the, the population uh, growth problem as well as the uh, pollution problem. So, that is what we will be discussing in the next lecture. Thank you.